Okay, our next speaker is from Brock University, uh, Dr. Val Fayardo. He did his PhD at the University of Waterloo uh, with Russ Tupling, and he's now a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Tissue Plasticity at Brock University. He's going to talk about GSK3 inhibition for conditions of muscle wasting, lessons from unloading and muscular dystrophy. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Hood, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, this just like Dr. Salim, uh, means a lot to me. I didn't help you out with any organization for any MHADs, but I have been attending several of them, so this certainly does mean a lot. And Dr. Tupling's in the building. Thank you, Russ, for the support. Um, unfortunately, I won't be presenting on Circa today, um, but I will be talking about an enzyme that we study quite heavily in my lab called GSK3, which stands for glycogen synthase kinase 3 and it's a serine threonine kinase that was first identified for phosphorylating and thus inactivating glycogen synthase and thus glycogen synthesis. However, we now know that it has over 100 cellular substrates and that it has two isoforms, GSK3 alpha and GSK3 beta. I've highlighted the GSK3 beta isoform here because it's the most dominant isoform found in skeletal muscle. So why are we interested in GSK3, and more specifically, why are we interested in inhibiting this enzyme or stopping this enzyme in muscle? Well, it turns out when you do this in muscle, when you stop GSK3, you can increase muscle size and muscle mass, and there's a variety of mechanisms and pathways with which this can occur. I don't have the time to elaborate on them in too much detail, so I'll just simply list them here. We can see an increase in protein synthesis a decrease in protein breakdown, so that's going to affect your, your net protein balance. And we also see an increase in myoblast fusion, which has implications for muscle development, but also muscle regeneration. And we've, we've shown this recently in my lab. This is um, Dr. Nigel Kurgan here. He's a newly minted PhD. He just uh, defended his PhD successfully two weeks ago, and he was supervised by Dr. Noda Klentru. And a few years back, he completed this, this side project in my lab, where he treated C2, C12 cells, for three days during differentiation with lithium. And lithium is a, is a known GSK3 inhibitor. And more specifically, uh, we use lithium chloride at a dose of 0.5 millimolar. And that's a low therapeutic dose of lithium commonly used to treat uh, patients with bipolar disorder. And when we treated them with lithium chloride, we found an increase in inhibitory serine phosphorylation. So that's serine 21 for GSK3 alpha and then serine 9 for GSK3 beta, both being increased with lithium chloride treatment. And this serine phosphorylation, what it does is it prevents GSK3, right here, from recognizing its substrate and thus binding to its substrate. So that's how, well, one of the ways with which lithium inhibits GSK3. Now, because of this inhibition of GSK3, we did, we did see an enhancement in myogenic differentiation and fusion. You can see over there in the top right, the myotubes stained here in green are, are larger. They have a lot more nuclei in them. And when we uh, probe for differentiation markers such as myogenin and myosin heavy chain, we do see an increase in both their protein content. The second reason as to why we're interested in inhibiting GSK3 against stopping GSK3 in muscle is because it turns out when you do this, you can improve muscle strength. So this is Kennedy Whitley. She defended her master's thesis with me last summer. And her master's thesis focused on GSK3 inhibition and MDX muscle pathology. I'll be showing you some of her data towards the end of my talk today. But for this slide, the slide that's in front of us, this is a, a side project that she worked on a couple years ago. And what she did is she took, I apologize if that's too small there, uh, she took male CPD7 BL6 mice and fed them a dose of lithium chloride, 10 milligrams per kilogram body mass per day for a total period of six weeks. After six weeks, we would euthanize the, the mouse, and we would collect the muscles for a contractile analysis, biochemical analysis, et cetera. But we also collected the serum, because we wanted to measure the, the lithium concentration in the serum. And with the help of our chemistry department at Brock University, who has an ICP mass spec, we found out that the concentration of lithium in those mice that were treated with lithium chloride turned out to be 0.02 millimolar. And I, I, I want to emphasize the fact that this is well below that, that therapeutic dose of 0.5 millimolar, commonly used to treat bipolar disorder. Nonetheless, if you look at the force frequency curves, this is isometric force, normalized to cross-sectional area. and uh, plotted against the stimulation frequency. You can see that as you increase the stimulation frequency, 
you increase the force production through force summation. However, this happens to a, a greater extent in the lithium-treated muscles, or soleus and EDL. Okay, the, the, the third reason as to why we're interested, it's also the final reason that I'll, I'll talk about today, uh, why we're interested in GSK3 and more specifically inhibiting GSK3 um, is because it can increase the proportion of the oxidative fiber types. And this has implications for fatigue resistance and, and muscle performance. So we know that our skeletal muscles, rodent muscles, that are made up of a mix of different fiber types. This is a fiber type staining protocol we've ad adapted in my lab. So you've got the blue type one, the green 2A fibers, they're, they're your most oxidative fibers. They have more mitochondria and they're, they're least fatigable relative to the glycolytic 2X and 2B fibers. What we know now is that if you inhibit GSK3, you can promote the type 1 and type 2A fibers by activating a transcription factor called NFAT or nuclear factor of, act of activated T cells. When you activate NFAT, it goes into the nucleus and it increases the transcription of genes associated with the oxidative program. So if we go back to Kennedy's six-week lithium feeding study, and uh, this is all in the soleus, by the way, you see a significant increase in that inhibitory serine phosphorylation. Again, that's how part of the ways in which lithium will inhibit GSK3. Now, GSK3 phosphorylates NFAT, so when we inhibit NFAT, we do see a drop in NFAT phosphorylation. That activates NFAT. It can now go to the nucleus, increase the transcription of genes associated with the oxidative phenotype, such as myosin heavy chain 1, and we see an increase in myosin heavy chain 1 protein. Over there on the far right, that's some fatigue data. So we mounted the soleus, applied a fatigue protocol, 70 hertz stimulation every two seconds for five minutes. And you can see that over time, the lithium chloride treated samples can maintain a higher percent of initial force and leading to a, a significantly higher area under the curve. So just to recap here, um, we're interested in stopping GSK3 uh, in muscle because it can increase muscle mass and muscle size. It can increase muscle strength and it can increase the percentage of oxidative fibers. So for the rest of my talk today, I'm gonna to be highlighting how these three features can benefit conditions of muscle wasting. First, talking about soleus muscle unloading, where the soleus is a postural muscle. It's helping me stand up right now, thank God. Um, so when you unload the soleus, um, you're gonna see soleus muscle atrophy, a decline in muscle strength, and also a decline in the oxidative fibers. There's a slow to fast fiber type shift. Okay, so I'm gonna be showing you some, some work from our lab using three rodent models of tenotomy, high limb suspension, and, and space flight. Finally, I will finish my talk talking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is an excellent muscle wasting disease characterized by muscle weakness and unfortunately early mortality. What's interesting though is that the oxidative fibers seem to be less prone to dystrophic pathology. So if we can increase muscle size, increase muscle mass, increase muscle strength, and increase the proportion of oxidative fibers with, uh, with GSK3 inhibition, can we offer resistance against dystrophic pathology? So I'll be showing you some of our work in the D2MDX model. Okay, so the, the first model of soleus unloading that I want to show you is that of tenotomy. And over here on the right, that's Colton Watson. That's a picture of him winning an MHAD poster award a few MHADs ago. Um, he's not my student. He uh, completed this side project with me. I like side projects, as you can tell. Actually, believe it or not, he's a, a PhD in an allergy and immunology lab, so uh, Russ likes to call him a muscle physiology wannabe. Uh, but anyway, here he is winning this poster award. And what he did, just like Kennedy, took male 57 BL6 mice, fed them that same dose of lithium chloride, 10 milligrams per kilogram body mass per day, again for six weeks. Okay, but on the fourth week, we conducted that tenotomy surgery. And what we, what we would do, we would certainly make a smaller incision than this, but for visual purposes, I think it will do. We would make a small incision and then transect the soleus and gastrocnemius tendon or simply cut the soleus and gastrocnemius uh, tendon. Then we would sew up that wound. It usually only takes one to two sutures. And then on the other side, we would make a, a similar size incision, but we would leave that tendon intact. And then we would sew it up, of course, and that would be your sham side, okay? And then we'd, we would return the mouse to their home cage for another period of two weeks where they would maintain their lithium or control treatment. And then, of course, we would euthanize them and collect their tissues. So here we've got sham in the open bars, uh, tenotomized in the red bars, and this is just some GSK3 content. 
and uh, phosphorylation data. Um, and maybe if you could just focus your attention on panel D here, over in the far right, just for the sake of time, that's the phosphorylation status of GSK3, an indication of how active GSK3 is. And there are two main effects that I want to highlight today. The first one is that of tenotomy, which lowers phosphorylation of GSK3, which to us tells us that it's activating GSK3, so unloading via tenotomy is activating GSK3. The second main effect is that of lithium chloride, which raises GSK3 phosphorylation, which tells us that it's effectively inhibiting GSK3. And in turn, when we look at my fiber size and the fiber type composition, we do find that lithium chloride treatment preserves my fiber cross-sectional area, and I apologize for the pun here, slows the slow to fast fiber type shift that occurs with soleus unloading uh, via tenotomy. So again, sham in the open, tenotomy uh, in the red, and maybe you could just focus your attention on panel B here, that's myofiber cross-sectional area, and looking at control, you see a significant drop in myofiber cross-sectional area, so that's consistent with, that's exactly what we'd expect with soleus unloading and muscle atrophy. We also see a significant drop in type 2A fiber percent in panel D, and a significant increase in type 2B fiber percent in panel F, which is overall indicative of that slow to fast fiber type shift. But when you look at the lithium chloride treated groups, we don't see any change in cross-sectional area. We don't see any change in type 2A fiber percent or any change in type 2B fiber percent, which overall suggests that lithium chloride treatment, and presumably through GSK3 inhibition, uh, attenuates the effects of soleus unloading or I guess disuse as well via tenotomy. Okay, so the second model of soleus unloading that I want to show to you today is that of hind limb suspension, which is the best accepted uh, space light analog. And we do this in, in my lab, in mice, it can also be done in rats, but in my lab we do this in mice. We suspend them by their tails for a, a period of seven to 14 days. And that will effectively unload the hind limb unload the soleus, leading to muscle atrophy, and that slow to fast fiber type shift. You see a decline in the proportion of slow fibers in as little as seven days of hind limb suspension. Over here on the far right, this is some unpublished work from our lab, from master student Ryan Baranowski. He's um, leading the hind limb suspension uh, study, and I've got a picture of him in the next couple of slides. But what he's showing here is that in the soleus, after seven days of hind limb suspension, there is lower phosphorylation of GSK3 beta, and also lower phosphorylation of GSK3 alpha, which overall suggests that GSK3 is more active after seven days of high limb suspension in, in both isoforms, okay? So then what happens if you, when you inhibit GSK3 and then apply that high limb suspension protocol? So these authors, Panzers and colleagues, uh, published this work in 2015, and what they did is they used a skeletal muscle-specific GSK3 beta knockdown model. So they, they just knocked down the most dominant isoform of GSK3. And what they found after 14 days of hind limb suspension, or I guess what they, what they didn't find, was any preservation of muscle mass or, or cross-sectional area, both wild type shown here in the closed bars and, and knockdown shown here in the open bars, experienced muscle atrophy and a decline in average myofiber cross-sectional area. But they did find an increase in the percent of oxidative fiber. So again, focus your attention maybe here, down here. Um, this is 14 days after hind limb suspension in the soleus, and you can see that uh, the knockdowns have more type 1 and 2A fibers, and relatively less 2X and 2B fibers compared with the wild type control. What's interesting, though, is if you take a look at their Western blots, sure enough, yeah, they were able to reduce GSK3 beta by about 50%. But when you look at GSK3 alpha, there's about a 25% increase in GSK3 alpha, which is interesting and perhaps important because we do know that GSK3 alpha and beta do have some functional redundancies with one another. So we're now wondering in my lab, well, what happens when you knock down both alpha and beta isoforms and then apply that hind limb suspension protocol? So we received these GSK3 alpha beta floxed uh, mice from Dr. Virginia Lee from the University of Pennsylvania and we crossed them with the HSA cream mice to generate the skeletal muscle specific uh, GSK3 alpha and beta knockdown model. And Brianna Hockey over here on the left, she's a master student in my lab and she deserves all the credit. She's doing all the hard work, the grunt work in terms of ear notching, DNA extraction, genotyping, setting up the breeding pairs to really generate this mouse line in our lab. And she'll be using this mouse line to determine whether knocking down GSK3 alpha and, and beta uh, can maybe mimic or even perhaps amplify the effects of voluntary wheel running in mice. 
Ryan Baranowski has promised there's, the, uh, there's, there's a picture of him. He'll be taking these mice and applying that hind limb suspension protocol. Now over on the right here, this is just some data from the soleus. There's no surgery, no tibiotomy, oops, oh, sorry, and no hind limb suspension, so just a, a basal state, if I may. And what you can see here is that there is a 50% reduction in GSK3 alpha and a 50% reduction in GSK3 beta. This is a partial knockdown model. We are using heterozygously flocks, GSK3 alpha and beta mice, but still, even in these het mice and in this basal state, we do see a significant increase in the soleus to body mass ratio. So really looking forward to what they come up with in the future. In addition to the genetic model, uh, we we're also going to be applying that lithium treatment and hind limb suspension uh, protocol. And I'm happy to say that this was recently funded by a Canadian Space Agency grant. But we're, we're not going to just look at muscle. We're going to look beyond that. We're going to be looking at bone health with our co-applicants, Dr. Uh, Noda Klentru and Dr. Wendy Ward. And we're also going to be looking at the brain and cognitive function with our co-applicant, Dr. Rebecca McPherson, who I've highlighted here because she'll be giving a talk in the next session. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm trying to look for her. I can't see her. Um, and of course, this will be led by two talented graduate students who are currently master's students in my lab, but they will be transitioning to PhD in the fall. OK. This is the last slide I want to show in terms of the soleus unloading side of things. And this is some of Ryan's work characterizing what happens to GSK3 content what happens to GSK3 activation um, after at least 30 days of space flight in the soleus muscle. So we were fortunate enough to get soleus muscle samples from three separate missions, NASA's RR1 and NASA's RR9. I've highlighted the RR9 mission because I'm going to show you uh, that data today. And from our European collaborators, the Bion M1 mission. And again, this is at least 30 days of space flight. And so what happens is when they're up in space, they're up in these specialized cages. You can see they're wired all the way around. They have something to cling on to. There's food bars in the back. It's temperature controlled. It's CO2 controlled. Um, maybe just to orient you to the graph here, the flight group is in red. The GC shown here is the ground control shown here in the open bars. And they're, they're your mice that are housed in these specialized cages but just here on Earth. And the, the vivarium control, they're just your mice housed in your standard lab cages. And what we can see is a significant reduction in both uh, GSK3 beta and alpha, I'm not showing you here, uh, compared with both GC controls. But however, when we look at a marker, a downstream marker of GSK3 activation, that being beta catenin, so essentially, uh, as part of its role in regulating the canonical wind signaling pathway, GSK3 will phosphorylate beta-catenin, leading to its proteasomal degradation. So simply put, an increase in GSK3 activation or activity can lead to a decrease in beta-catenin, and that's exactly what we find here in the flight group compared with both controls. So this could suggest that although GSK3 content is reduced in the soleus after at least 30 days of space flight, its activation or activity may still be elevated, or at the very least, uh, wind, the wind pathway is, is off. OK, so I'll, I'll take a hard stop here on the muscle unloading side of things. And I'm going to finish the rest of my talk uh, with the Duchenne muscular dystrophy side of things, showing you some of our work in the preclinical uh, D2MDX model. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a severe muscle wasting disorder. It's caused by these X-linked recessive mutations to the dystrophin gene, so it primarily affects males. And all these mutations, they lead to the, the uh, complete absence of this protein, uh, this purple rod-like protein called dystrophin that holds our membranes and muscles intact as we go through the wear and tear of contraction and relaxation cycles. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, the oxidative type 1 blue and oxidative type 2A green fibers are less prone to dystrophic pathology compared with the uh, glycolytic fibers. And there's probably a number of reasons as to why this is the case. One reason that I like to highlight or talk about a lot is this differential expression in eutrophin. And so this is eutrophin mRNA uh, plotted against fiber types. And you can see that the oxidative type 1 and 2A fibers have more eutrophin versus the glycolytic fibers. Now, eutrophin sounds like dystrophin, and it also looks like dystrophin. It's also this rod-like protein. And it can provide some compensatory membrane stability in the absence of dystrophin. So if we can increase eutrophin by increasing the proportion of oxidative type 1 and 2A fibers, can we offer some sort of resistance to Duchenne muscular dystrophy? That's the question that we're asking with this GSK3 inhibition project. And leading the way here, we have two uh, students. I've already shown you Kennedy Whitley. She's taken on the skeletal muscle side of things. 
a PhD candidate in my lab, Sophie Hampshire. She's taken on the cardiac muscle side of things. I unfortunately don't have time uh, to show you any of that uh, cardiac data, but I will show you Kennedy's data now. And so what we did is we treated uh, D2MDX mice with titaglucid. Titaglucid is uh, a GSK3 inhibitor. It's part of the TDZD family. It's a thiodiazole adenone. Nailed it. Um, it's most... <laughs> It's the, most, it's the most clinically advanced GSK3 inhibitor. There are ongoing clinical trials for its use in myotonic dystrophy type 1, uh, supranuclear palsy, Alzheimer's disease, and autism spectrum disorders. And, and we thought that this was important because we, we wanted to test a GSK3 inhibitor that uh, could be potentially, I guess, rapidly integrated into the clinical setting. And again, we treated D2MDX mice, which are DBA2JMDX mice, which, by the way, were first introduced to me uh, by York's very own Dr. Chris Perry. So thank you for that, Dr. Perry. Um, and they are a severe mouse model of muscular dystrophy. And again, we treated them with titaglucid or, or vehicle through oral gavage at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram body mass per day for a total period of two to four weeks. And we started treatment at six to seven weeks of age. So this is all data in the, in the EDL, um, and you can see that titaglucid treatment shown in the red bars um, increased that inhibitory serine phosphorylation, so it inhibited GSK3. As a result of that, we get an increase in beta-catenin, that downstream marker of GSK3 activation. And, and again, also this is in the EDL. When you take a look at the EDL to body mass ratio, the wild type shown here in open bars, the MDX vehicle shown here in the closed bars, you see a significant drop in the EDL to body mass ratio, which was attenuated with titaglucid treatment. And then if you can focus your attention here, this is the percent of oxidative fibers in red, the combined percent of type 1 and 2A fibers, which we've increased with titaglucid treatment. And corresponding well with this, we get that increase in eutrophin. Again, that compensatory uh, protein, or that protein that can provide compensatory membrane stability. So when we look at the histological H&E stains, vehicle on the top, titaglucid on the bottom, this is all EDL. We, we do see a drop in necrotic area. And we also see a significant drop in the serum CK, which is another marker of muscle damage. When we look at function, we do see slight improvements in cage activity. We see better improvements in their ability to, uh, to perform on the hang wire test. And when we look at the EDL force frequency curves, we do see a significant improvement in specific force production, particularly at 100 hertz, at 100 hertz and 150 hertz in the titaglucid treated uh, MDX muscles. So just to conclude here, I've shown you some data, perhaps suggesting that GSK3 inhibition can benefit conditions of soleus muscle unloading and also Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I do think it's worth noting that um, there are other muscle wasting conditions that I just couldn't talk about today and, and fit into my talk that seem to also benefit from GSK3 inhibition, and this includes myotonic dystrophy type 1, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, ALS, inclusion body myositis. I've included the references here, so you don't have to just take my word for it. But there, there is a, there's a growing body of evidence suggesting that GSK3 inhibition can be used to combat several muscle wasting conditions. And hopefully, we'll, we'll add to this list with some future studies, hopefully with space light, um, denervation, cancer cachexia, sarcopenia, and, and sarcopenic obesity, which is characterized by an increase in adiposity and a decrease in muscle mass and strength and further increases risk of cardiovascular disease and further increases risk of early mortality. Now this will be tying in another area of research in my lab that I won't, I won't talk about today, uh, looking at GSK3 inhibition as a way to promote adaptive thermogenesis. Um, Mia Jaramella, who's leading this project on the muscle side of things, isn't here today, but her partner in crime, Jessica Braun, is, is here, and I'm looking at her right now. I'm sure she'd love to uh, chat about that. Anyway, I'll, I'll close it there, and I'll say thank you to my lab, both past and present members, the collaborators, and funding sources, and thanks again, Dr. Hood, for the introduction, uh, in invitation. <laughs> Oh, lots of questions for this. Lika, go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lukas Sydow from University of Copenhagen. Hi, Val. Nice to meet you in person, finally. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you in person. <clears throat> very nice day, Tim. Thank you for the talk. Um, with your um, GSK3 inhibition, you find this shift in fiber type, and you also see this reduction in fatigue and increase in strength. Um, so these are all um, processes that are very much regulated by calcium. I was wondering if you looked at cal calcium handling in, in your studies. So I promised I wasn't going to talk about circa, but <laughs> GSK3 inhibition, at least in the heart, 
um, we're starting to look in, in skeletal muscle as well, um, can increase the expression of circa 2 and can enhance circa function. We've shown that in the heart, but uh, we will start looking at that in skeletal muscle because that could have a role in terms of you know, the contractile properties. Thank okay. you. So which other question, did you look at glucose metabolism? Glucose metabolism? Yeah, with inhibition of TSK3? We, we haven't yet in the, in, in the lithium project, oh, we haven't yet in the Tidoglucid project. We have a GSK3 knockdown, Brianna Hockey, who's doing the voluntary wheel running on, on the GSK3 knockdown mice. They just, they're finishing it this week? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So I'll have more to talk okay. about later, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll go over here. Uh, Stephen Brown, University of Copenhagen, and that's basically in relation to the last thing. You didn't look at glycogen at all uh, in relation to the fatigability or the chronic studies? Not yet. There were plans with, with Yoakum to look at uh, glycogen, not only content, but also distribution. And uh, hopefully we'll follow through on those plans. I, I own a beer, apparently, so we'll chat about that. Thank you. Thanks. So, so GSK3 beta, it negatively regulates heat shock factor one, which is the transcription factor for HSP70. Yep. And about 10 years ago, we showed that if you activate, if you overexpress or activate HSP70, you recapitulate and you get outstanding recovery in both the double knockout and MDX mice. So have you measured the heat shock proteins and do they you know, how do you know that the mechanism is not through HSP70? That's a, that's a good question. I think you're referring to the Gehrig paper? Gehrig, right? yeah. And the, that was HSP70 exp overexpression and BGP15 treatment, yeah. right? Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the paper. We, we have shown, at least in the heart, that GSK3 inhibition will increase HSP70. And also, <laughs> Paige Geiger, I believe, um, has shown in the brain that GSK3 inhibition will increase HSP70. But for the context of muscular dystrophy, you're right. We should be also looking at HSP70 in the tidoglucid treated. Yeah, maybe, maybe an idea might be to repeat those experiments mm -hmm. in a HSP70 knock, muscle specific knockout. Right, right. And we can send you that if you want it. And then, awesome. and then you'll see if it's HSP70 or not. That's just a suggestion. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Henrik Wackerhager, Technical University of Munich. I'm really intrigued about the lithium chloride because, I mean, I think it's an approved drug. It improves your mood. It makes your muscles bigger. You get more oxidative fibers. Should we not just take a bucket of it and chuck it in the drinking water? <laughs> Is there any downside to it, to a lithium chloride treatment? Well, so, first off, that's a better suggestion than my colleague, Dr. Renee Vandenboom, who just said, let's just throw lithium chloride in beer. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we just published a review um, talking about how low-dose lithium treatment can benefit uh, muscle, bone, brain health, and cellular resilience against aging. The, the thing I caution about with, with lithium treatment is it is used within a narrow therapeutic range, right? 0 0.5 millimolar that I talked about, that's on the low end. Um, if you go to one millimolar and, and slightly above that, you, you then take that medicine and it becomes maybe a poison, right? So um, I think we've got to be careful with, with that. <laughs> I hope okay, that answers thank you. your, your question. Thanks. So uh, Val, uh, I, I'm a little surprised that GSK3 inhibition hasn't been uh, popularized before this. You made a list of all of the potential muscle wasting conditions that inhibition of GSK3 might benefit. And I'm surprised we, I'm surprised we don't know more about this. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's good for my lab. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think maybe that goes with the fact that GSK3 is a main target for Alzheimer's disease. Maybe that is taking all of the attention as opposed to skeletal muscle. So that's what I wanted to highlight here today was that GSK3 could be a target for several uh, muscle wasting conditions, potentially. Very promising. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Val. Thank you.